Safety News in New York 2020 continues. What is your idea of the ideal man? Well, for centuries, he's been the protector of women. And while women's roles have been redefined over the last 25 years, by and large, men are still expected to be the providers and protectors. And now there's a provocative new book that addresses questions like, do men really have all the power? Do they want it? Tonight, we turn the floor over to the men to hear what they think. And it will be men only, with the exception of our correspondent, Catherine Pryor. It's a man's world. Men have all the power. Is it really true? One man says no. Men define as power what any other group would be intelligent enough to call powerlessness. Men make the laws more to protect women than we do to protect ourselves. That's what we need to confront, is our willingness to make men more disposable than women. Meet um, Warren Farrell, best-selling author and self-styled social anthropologist, leading an assault on our traditional thinking about men. If we're picking up the check at the end of dinner, we're going to be responsible for providing the financial womb in this relationship, W-O-M-B, womb. While his ideas are social and political, the rhetoric is, well, kind of Madison Avenue, just filled with catchy phrases. We really care in the society a lot more about saving whales than saving males. And if we don't question the male role to a greater degree in the next 25 years, we are talking about the potential extinction of the species. But Farrell wasn't always so attentive to men. In fact, for years he focused almost exclusively on women's issues, rubbing shoulders with feminist leaders like Gloria Steinem. And he's still a card-carrying member of the National Organization for Women. When women were criticizing men, I was supporting their criticism of men by calling it liberation, insight, a new framework, a paradigm shift. He says his attitude changed as he noticed an increasing tendency among some feminists to bash males. Farrell began to suspect that men were not the powerful, insensitive bad guys they perceived, and that men needed to speak up more about issues that concerned them. I believe that women cannot hear what men do not say. And he's got a lot to say to both men and women in his provocative new book, The Myth of Male Power. In it, he claims that for far too long, men have been fated for war, programmed for work, and divorced from emotion, all making men what he calls the disposable sex. We care more about women. We care more about women dying from breast cancer than we do about equal numbers of men dying of prostate cancer. We care more about it when a woman is raped than we do when a man is killed on the streets. Uh, we care more about it when a woman is exposed to some type of uh, jeopardy in the workplace than we do that 94% of the people who die in the workplace are men. Is it really that we don't care or what you said earlier, that women can't hear what men don't say, that society mm -hmm. can't hear what men yes. don't express? It is both. Men do not speak up because we have learned to be the protectors. Inside of our psyche is an unconscious expectation that men will risk their lives and play this role. Throughout all of history, we had to train men to be disposable because the more disposable they were, the more they would be willing to save the community and save women and save the children. Thank you for protecting me. Since Farrell claims to be expressing what men really feel, we got together this group of men to listen to his ideas. We have learned to be the protectors. Is there a sense, as he describes, of having to protect women in general? That there's some duty? There was a lot of pressure to, to play that role. Protect your sister. Uh, even though she was bigger than me, I was supposed to protect uh -huh. her. You know, it's, it's ingrained. Uh, you know, the one gentleman said something about going hunting and fishing with dad. Way before the first trout fishing trip with the old man, I was sitting in front of the TV watching Popeye on Thai, on thai olive oil. I mean, but Farrell believes it's time for men to get out of this protection racket, starting with their role in war. If we cared about a man dying, he wouldn't go to war. He wouldn't defend us. So we had to make men accept their willingness to dispose of themselves in war will give you a medal of honor. That's a bribe for men to die. But 
men went to war mm -hmm. to, to conquer, mm -hmm. to acquire goods, to acquire women, to acquire uh, property. What men learned all of our lives is that we wouldn't be worthy of a woman unless we had money and unless we had property. Every day we Farrell claims that men are disposable even the off the battlefield. We're not aware that men are killed twice as often as women are killed. As evidence, he points to this Time magazine cover story. Of 464 people killed by gunfire in a single week, 84% were male. Yet the cover features a picture of a woman. Why are crimes against women given so much publicity? I suppose because men have been committing crimes against men for so long that it's not news anymore. Men are the perpetrators of most of the violence. And part of the reason why we need to question all of male socialization is because we train men to be violent and then we go around and complain about the violent behavior of Mike Tysons right after we've been appreciating them and loving them for being Mike Tysons. Every day we reinforce our appreciation of the killer man. We train boys in football to be killer men. Is this not something sort of ingrained in the male species? It is ingrained in the male species and we've selected for it and it's now dysfunctional. The football player was just a metaphor for the best what? The best performer, the doctor, a metaphor for the doctor, the lawyer, the engineer. As long as you perform, you'll be cheered for. But when men don't perform well, says Farrell, they become even more disposable. That's why he calls men the suicide sex. We don't even know that the average man is four times as likely to commit suicide as the average woman. We are very good in the society about having things like battered women's shelters, um, about rape crisis hotlines. We are not good in the society about reaching out to men where they're hurt. In fact, men's suicide rates double following divorce or unemployment, just when their performer role is most being questioned. And suicide is just one area where Farrell says men need more help. Take health care. In 1920, the average man died only one year sooner than the average woman. And in 1990, the average man died seven years sooner than the average woman. And yet we have a public consciousness that says we're neglecting women health-wise more than men. We have a consciousness and a concern for women's breast cancer, but almost equal numbers of men die of prostate cancer, and yet breast cancer receives 660% as much funding as prostate cancer. Look. For years, they would not pay attention to women who had breast cancer. Now that there's attention being paid to breast cancer, you have a fellow who's now saying, you know, like that this indicates that men are being treated disproportionately worse off than, than women. But that doesn't make sense. how do you feel about the notion that men are dying seven years earlier on average than women? That's a shame. We need to work together to, 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 so that, so that, so that. statistics are right, you know, he's got a point. I, I knew that if m women had died only one year sooner than men in 1920, and now they suddenly died seven years sooner, that every one of us in the country would know that. And we would be justifying women's health programs, reaching out to women. And yet, when the reverse was happening, almost no one in the country knows that. One of the reasons nobody knows about issues that concern men, says Farrell, is because men are notoriously reluctant to talk about things that bother them, whether it's their health, their relationships, well, especially, it seems, their emotions. Being in touch with your feelings tends to run counter to playing the traditional male role. I think everybody benefits when a man learns to communicate, and no one benefits when a man represses, turns to drinking, turns to gambling, turns to homicide, turns to suicide, and then explodes in what I call the male volcano. No one benefits from that behavior. Men do not express their feelings. I think that's the inherent problem. It's much easier to look and fix other people's problems. But men can, can rule the world and control the bomb, and yet fear problem. emotion? That's the problem that men have. We simply can't express it, because if we express it, we are less powerful. We have less authority. We have less self-confidence. All the things which have been programmed into us as something we feel we need. And that, says Farrell, is the primary myth of male power. Because in order for men to live longer, get in touch with their feelings, be less violent, be less disposable, men need to question our society's very definition of power. Which is why in each workshop, he asks the same question. If you had another child, 
if you would ideally like to spend six months to a year raising that child full time, not working outside the home at all? Raise your hand if you had that social permission. Full time. You get a man involved with nurturing and loving and connecting with his child and especially not worried about depriving him of economic security and boy you often see a different man you see a brighter more loving side of him a more nurturing side of him we have to start to say to men and women both that the man who is a family manager what we call maybe a house husband uh, we can love and respect that a woman who is successful and is career oriented needs to be able to feel comfortable quote marrying down so what did our group think of Warren Farrell's ideas? Right. I think that Farrell's been asleep for a couple yeah. of years. <laughs> I just missed what's gone on here for the last <laughs> five or ten or fifteen years anyway. So I think men are very, very, very much different than that now. Does he make some legitimate points, some points that hit home? I think what Mr. Farrell does is to point out appropriately that sexism affects both men and women. The main point that I took from him is that women don't care what men feel. To me, the profound hip. issue that this guy is getting at is what price do you pay for power? What <laughs> price have men paid to have too much of it? And what price will women pay as they achieve more of it? The big stuff. Who do you think you are? Power is not accumulating a series of economic rewards. Power is having control over your own life. Okay, Catherine, our turn. Do you think, you personally think, that most women still want the powerful man, the protector, even though we want our own rights? I think so. I think that Warren made a lot of good points. What I thought was interesting mm -hmm. was that the fellows we talked to seemed reluctant to agree with a lot of his things, but yet when you talk about the issues, separate and apart from the book, they seem to agree with much yeah. of it. And what do you think? Well, I, I think that times are changing. I think the women's movement did so much for yeah. us, and maybe some of that has spilled over to the fellows, but maybe they need a uh, little help on their own. I think, in a way, it's generational. My generation perhaps still feels the strong protector, but perhaps the younger ones, the men do stay home. The men more. They do nurture the children. It is a, a different situation, I think. We I think we all want yeah. more control over li our lives and the opportunity to make our own choices. I'm going to tell everybody what you said before we went on the air. Catherine said, and you know, you might just point out that I'm free for dinner, provided... Who's buying? Who's buying? <laughs> we'll be right back. Oh.